بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله وحبيبه اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله رب العالمين All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Indeed Allah what he has guided us to is so beautiful it is so full of light it is so full of happiness our religion the beautiful gift of Islam. We thank Allah for Islam. We thank Allah for guidance. We thank Allah for the gift of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We thank Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the gift of our families. We thank Allah for the gift of being able to speak, being able to hear, being able to see. We thank Allah for all of his blessings, the subtle, that which we know, that which we do not know, that which is apparent, that which is hidden. Oh, to all the number of all of his blessings, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to make us among those who are grateful. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his loftiest peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, who taught us every good, and upon his noble family, his illustrious companions, and all those who follow him until the day of judgment. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed moment that we're in, that out of his generosity and out of his mercy, he include you and I, all those that are watching, all those that are hearing, and all those who will watch and hear, that Allah Ta'ala include us amongst them. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Amma ba'd, to begin, inshallah, I welcome you all to this new class that we are offering for level three of the youth curriculum, and it is on the rights of parents the rights of parents and this is an extremely important class and it's also one that i'm very excited to teach and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that through teaching this class may allah ta'ala make all of us noble people that fulfill the rights of our parents may allah forgive us for any shortcomings again this class is called the rights of parents attaining honor by serving one's parents in this class inshallah we're going to be speaking and introducing you to the text, the author of the text, and the aims and purposes, and some of the virtues concerning the rights of parents. So why did we choose this class, and why is this class important? This class is very important, brothers and sisters, because one of the signs of the end of time, and one of the turmoils and fitnas and trials that will spread amongst the ummah is the mass disobedience and disrespect of parents. And we're going to exp speak about what that exactly is, what that entails. But this is why this class is very important for our youth in particular. Why? Because if we don't have things right with our parents, we really don't understand the importance and the focus of our religion. And inshallah, you'll be able to see that. So in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this wonderful work put together by a great West African scholar named Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud. This is the author of our text. And Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud bin Ahmed Fal Ali Aqubi. He was born around 1260 after Hijri, 1844 roughly. And he died and passed away in the year 1905. And he's currently buried in Mauritania, West Africa. And inshallah, we're going to speak a little bit about this wonderful sheikh. Now, why are we speaking about this imam? Why should we speak about this imam? And what is it that we need to highlight about this wonderful imam? Brothers and sisters, one of the ways that we surpass in our studies and one of the ways that we will have the doors of acceptance open to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through honoring our teachers, honoring our parents, honoring those who deserve and have a right above us to honor them. 
and amongst them being our teachers. Now, one of the neglected aspects in our time is the, also the disrespect of teachers themselves. And if we want to benefit from our knowledge, we must honor our teachers. This is why, really, before you study any major science of Islam, we need to read a primer and a text before it on the adab and the, the manners and etiquettes that are due to a teacher such as respecting your teacher, honoring your teacher, holding him in high esteem, or her if you have a sister who's a teacher, a nustada, a sheikha, and then always keeping them in your du'as and always checking up on them and always asking how they are doing. Certainly their, your du'a is the least that you can offer to your teachers. In our time, we see people learning from people and then they just kind of neglect them. They don't check up on them. They never say how you're doing. You know, just send them a salam, a simple, you know. And at the least, even if you didn't connect with them, but that you honored them through making dua for them, this is very important. One of my blessed teachers, may Allah bless him and honor him. He told me when I first started studying with him, he said, there's a lot of people that have studied Islamic law in Sharia but very few who Allah allowed them to actually teach and to go out and spread that knowledge. And this was very early on, and may Allah reward him for that. And he told me that the reason why he felt many of them were selected for that post of teaching and spreading knowledge and benefiting from their knowledge, and Allah Ta'ala billah, not taken away that knowledge, was that they had adab and etiquette with the knowledge. They had adab when they sought knowledge. They had adab with their teachers. And this is very important. So in speaking about this wonderful sheikh, we have to realize that as we take from his knowledge, he, inshallah, also will receive this reward in his grave and the hereafter, in the barzakh. Why? Because... One of the three categories of things that will benefit a person after they die from this world is knowledge that they leave behind, thereby others benefit from. This is a part of uh, actions that will not be cut off even when one dies. So, and inshallah, when I get to the hadith about the one who guides to good is like the one who did it, I will expand on this. The the ulama are warathatul anbiya. They are the inheritors of the prophets. They are the ones whom Allah has entrusted and Allah has singled them out in the Quran by much praise of them. <inaudible> Verily, those who truly honor or have reverent fear and awe of Allah are the ulama and the scholars. Allah raises in degrees those who believe amongst us and those in particular who have knowledge. So let's look a little bit about this great scholar. He was considered a reviver of his time. And those that were in our class before called Maharam al lisan the prohibitions of the tongue, we expanded a little bit on his biography, but just by way of uh, honoring our teachers and those whom we take knowledge from, um, we may, it is noteworthy that we mention them and that we connect to them because we have fathers in our you know, in, in, in reality, we have our father and our mother, but we also have fathers in spirituality. And we have our mashaykh and our scholars, and they are our leaders, and they are our masters, so to speak, in that they really, they have the forefront, and we're to look up to them, and we're to honor them, and we're to respect them. Now, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he mentioned in one hadith that verily Allah will send or raise up in this nation, this ummah, at the beginning of every century, someone who will revive the religion. These are called the mujaddids, the mujaddidun. And a good translation of that would be revivers of the religion. Not reformers, because there's nothing to reform in our beautiful religion. But revivers, they revive that which has been lost. Right? And when we connect to our beautiful religion, when we connect to the Quran, to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, through struggling, through striving, through learning, through prayer, through fasting, and doing these other good deeds that Allah Ta'ala has told us to do, we are bringing life to our heart. 
as the Prophet ﷺ said that the likeness of the one who remembers Allah and the one who doesn't remember Allah is like the likeness of the living and the dead, right? So this is what all this does, that it brings our hearts back to life. And these scholars also play a very important role in reviving the religion. And he was considered by many scholars of his time to be a mujaddid and a reviver. So this is a big, big scholar who lived in the last century, rahimahullah ta'ala. He came from a line, long line of great scholars and judges within his family. And his first teacher was his mother, who taught him the Quran. And he was very pious, and he excelled in every single field of knowledge, including um, spirituality, spirituality, theology, Islamic law, Arabic language, um, the etiquettes of giving in sadaqah, the etiquettes of reciting the Qur'an. There's many, many wonderful books that he um, authored and some that I was very blessed to sit with, a teacher of mine from West Africa who taught some of those texts multiple times uh, in my uh, former community that I was in. And so we benefited tremendously from that. He spent most of his time teaching, reciting the Qur'an, engaging in ibadah, and writing and authoring texts, uh, the Sheikh didn't waste time. And that's another thing that before we really begin this class, in Namal A'malu bin Niyat, actions are based upon intention. We should make every noble intention in this class. Not only that we are learning sacred knowledge and responding to the call of Allah and His Messenger, but that we are through it seeking to revive our hearts and the hearts of those around us and to revive our communities and to bring back the lost beautiful tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu and to bring back and remind others of what they had forgotten. And I can tell you that many, many people have completely forgot what relates to the rights of the parents. Inshallah, and we'll speak about that. Now, not to expand too much on the blessed Imam and his noble life. What, what are we reading? We're reading a text that he wrote and on the rights of parents and bitter walidain, which is filial piety, being good to our parents, giving them the rights that they deserve. And the format of this class, the way that it will be taught, is I'm going to be reading the translation of the poem that he had written on this topic, and we're going to read those lines and then expand and give meaning to them, give commentary and explain them, and also share what is relevant in our lives, what, it, what we can put in practice. And also highlighting, I believe, some of what is very prevalent in our time and we're just doing wrong. So inshallah, we have to try to correct that and make it better. So let's now start directly into the text. The Sheikh begins, Praise be due to the one who in the Quran has linked iman or faith with ihsan or excellence. So he starts by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is based on a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So now you might ask, okay, we as Muslims, many things we begin, we begin with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, we begin with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Why? Right? Part of it is to take barakah and blessings by mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is an immense barakah and greatness that is attached in just uttering the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Jewish community after the first, you know, after the first century, uh, after common era, or the year 70 or so, if I remember correctly, they no longer pronounced the noble, sanctified name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, until today, many of them just refer to God by a type of pronoun, not directly by his blessed name, as they be believe that none really had the right to utter it after that first time. We as Muslims have been very, very blessed in that Allah Ta'ala allowed it. And this is an ayah in the Quran that Allah has given permission that his mention is made and his blessed name is also uttered. So to say, Bismillah, in the name and with the name of Allah, right? The blessed name, the name Allah, Lafzul Jalala, Wal Ismul Jalala. 
This is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned more than 2,000 times in the Quran. This name is comprises of all of the other attributes, all in this very name. So when we say Bismillah, we're seeking help and assistance and beginning with the name of Allah. Now everything we are doing, we're connecting or disconnecting ourselves from our own ability to think we do good deeds, to think we have intelligence, to think that we can speak on our own, but we're connecting completely to Allah's power and His guidance and His facilitation and His assistance. This is what we all, part of what we mean when we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And then he says, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is the best way to begin something. And hence it leads us to the hadith that every matter that does not begin, of course, every matter, every important matter that does not begin with Alhamdulillah is cut off. Is cut off. Not totally cut off as the scholars explain, but cut off from barakah and blessing. Barakah is a subtle goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in something. It's a, it's a type of special goodness that Allah ta'ala puts in something and expands it and blesses it. This is what barakah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also began the Quran. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahmanir rahim maliki yawmin deen. He started his book with Alhamdulillah, which is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising himself. So we praise Allah and also we acknowledge that every single blessing and goodness that we have is from Allah and we attribute it to Allah. There's a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that the best dua is to say Alhamdulillah. The best prayer is Alhamdulillah. Why is it the best prayer? Because what are we seeking when we make dua? We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, if you are grateful, then Allah, Allah has declared that if you show gratitude, I will increase you. Allah increases us if we show gratitude. And by saying Alhamdulillah, we're expressing this gratitude. And thereby, it is indirectly in a way asking Allah Ta'ala for more. Because you're grateful. Allah gives us, we say Alhamdulillah. We get more because we show gratefulness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so this is the best of du'as. Now, Then he says that all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has linked Iman with Ihsan. So we want to look at what he means by this. And we want to see inshallah in this first ayah that we will share. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, remember when we took a pledge from the children of Israel. Israel, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Remember when we took a pledge from the children of Israel? Worship none but God, be good to your parents. We see in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Worship Allah, worship God, join nothing with Him, be good to your parents. Now we're seeing in all these ayahs directly Allah is telling us to believe and be good to your parents. Believe and be good to your parents. Keeps connecting that. Again in another verse. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا for your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and honor your parents and show ihsan to your parents. This is a very beautiful, comprehensive word that we will expand on. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, also in another part of the Quran, say, O Prophet, come, let me recite to you what your Lord has forbidden to you. Do not associate others with Him in worship. Do not fail to honor your parents. Again, Look how many times Allah Ta'ala, He connects both of them back to back with faith. Faith, ihsan to walidain. 
This is why one of the great scholars in his commentary of the Quran, Ruh al Bayan, mentions that the most important matter after the belief in the oneness of Allah is showing ihsan and excellence to the parents. Showing excellence to the parents. So, one of the things we should reflect upon when we recite the Quran is Allah Ta'ala does not put things in any random order. Everything, the way it is structured and laid out in the Quran and revealed to us has subtle teachings, messages, and highlights for us to pick up on. And so what is this basically teaching us? That showing excellence to our parents is right after belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tawheed, that it's as that much importance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh Muhammad Mawlud continues, he has promised paradise to the righteous and his promise is never broken. So he has promised paradise for the abrar. The abrar is the plural of bir. And this is a promise that Allah has made to those who show bir and excellence to their parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah, this is the promise of Allah. Allah never breaks his promise because Allah ta'ala, he is wa'da. He's given a wa'd and a promise. And then he says, may, may Allah send prayers and peace upon the one who said. So here he's basically saying, salawat upon the Prophet Muhammad wasallam." but he didn't leave it at that. This is a type of eloquence in the Arabic language. And in the beginning of text, scholars will often show their profound knowledge of Arabic, their profound way of excellence and how they express themselves. And one of our teachers once mentioned that this is in a way to also show that the person who is teaching and, and writing is uh, worthy of such writing because they have the prerequisites and they have that knowledge. May Allah make us like that as well. Ameen. What did then the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, peace and blessings be upon. May Allah send his blessings and peace upon the one who said, the pleasure of our Lord most high and the anger of his exaltedness are both in the similitude of a person's parents. So this is based upon a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he mentioned that um, the, and I believe we have a text for that as well. We'll share it here. That the pleasure of the Lord lies in the pleasure of the parent. The anger of the Lord lies in the anger of the parent. That ridha rabbi fi ridha al-walidi. That the ridha, this is the, um, you know, the contentment and the acceptance, the pleasure of Allah rests in the pleasure of the parent. And that Allah's anger is ghadab and him punishing us and putting us in a bad state, a'udhu billah, is in the angering of the parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. So he highlights that. And also in sending salawat upon the Prophet Muhammad, salawatullahi rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi, he's also highlighting now another important thing. That there's also a hadith that every important matter, every matter that does not begin with prayers upon me, will also be cut off. Meaning from barakah. So this is why the scholars, they say, anything important that you're doing, you're getting married, you're starting a business, you're in any transaction, anything of importance that you're doing, start with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, right? The Basmala, the beginning, the saying the Bismillah, thanking Allah and sending prayers and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then that which you are going to do, will be filled with barakah. And there's much on the virtues of parents that some we want to highlight. One that whoever wants that their life be extended, whoever wants that their life be expended, extended and their provision to be increased. So if you want longer life and also your provision to increase, then let them show birr and excellence to their parents and connect their kinship bonds. Connect the kinship bonds. Show good, be good to your parents. Connect your kinship bonds and you'll have your life extended and your provisions widened or made ample. A man once asked the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who is the one that is most deserving of my excellent companionship? Meaning that when I'm with him, I should be 
the best to them. Who has the most rights upon me? This is a famous hadith most of you are aware of. He told the man, your mother. And then he said, then who? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, then your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your mother. Then who? Then your father. So here, Rasulullah ﷺ, he mentions the mother three times, and the scholars, they do mention that the amount of pain and hardship and difficulty that the mother went through, the father doesn't go through. So he has that, she has that special rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet ﷺ talked about the manifestation of the mercy of Allah, the example that he used in this world as the epitome and the foremost example of mercy was that of a mother towards her child. Not that of a father. Fathers, Allah made us different. He didn't make us like mothers. We have our own jobs and mothers have their own jobs, right? And in that, we celebrate the beauty of the natural way that Allah Ta'ala has created us. That's the natural way. And we each fulfill our role. And in reality, there's, you know, no father is really complaining about that they are not getting their particular right. No, the father, alhamdulillah, also has their noble station. And there's a lot that, inshallah, we will mention. Thereafter, he says, Thereafter, since whoever guides to goodness is like the one who actually performs the good, and for this praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he separates between his intro and he says, Thereafter, um, since whoever guides to goodness, so he's highlighting something that he's guiding to good. And the Prophet وسلم, he mentioned, The one who guides to a good is like the one who did it. On another hadith in Muslim, the one who guides to something good gets the same reward as the one who performs the good. That was in relation to a man whose riding beast died and he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, do you have a riding beast? He said, I don't, but he said, I will point you to somebody that does. And then he went to go get his riding beast. Then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the one who guides to something good gets the same reward as the one who performs that good. And this is a huge, huge blessing for us as Muslims. Because the scholars, they mentioned that if you call someone to Islam or if you call someone to prayer and then they pray or they become Muslim or any good that you call to, or for example, there are people trying to raise money for poor people. You want to help feed the hungry. You want to do something good like that, but you don't have the money. But you go and you fundraise, right? You ask others to help. You command others to help and say they gave money. You would get the same reward as those who gave money even though you didn't. Because, you know, you're unable to accept it, but you reminded them. So look at our beautiful religion. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that we just guide to something good, Allah ta'ala will give us the reward. That the one who guides to a good is like the one who did it. And this is an immense, immense blessing because there are many, many teachers. All of us as parents are teachers. You guys that are young, you'll be teachers. You can teach others around you. And when you guide someone, and they are guided, you will get all their reward. What, what is to say that if you went to somebody and told them something good to do, and then they went and told five people, those five people went and told 20 people, those 20 people went and told 100 people, that 100 people went and told 1,000. On the day of judgment, you can come, and you might have mountains and mountains of good deeds, and you don't even know where it came from, because after you died, the good kept spreading. Telemarketers do this with dunya. Telemarketers and others, nothing wrong with it, but they're told if you sign on, like for example, these many customers, you'll get 10% of their commission for a lifetime. And people work hard. They work really, really hard. If I can get up to $10,000 of this, or if I can get 100000 of this, I'll get residual income of ten grand for the rest of my life. So they work hard. They push, they push, they push. Yet we as Muslims are told if you guide to a good, if you're telling others to do good and they do it, then you're not getting 10%, you're getting 100% of all the good that they're doing. 100% of all the good that they're doing. Therefore, alhamdulillah, you get all of the same rewards. This is a blessing from Allah. He says, and Allah has made the fulfilling of the rights of, of, of parents an obligation upon everyone. 
this being established by the Quran, Sunnah, and Ijma, consensus. So, what does he mean here? He's just highlighting the fact that being good to your parents, there's no doubt about this. There's no doubt about its obligation. This is established in the Quran by the ayahs that we read. It is established in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In one hadith he mentioned that shall I not tell you of the worst of the major sins? They said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, associating partners with Allah, that is shirk, Al-Ishraqu Billah means to associate and do shirk billah, and disrespecting your parents. Uquq al-Walidain, which is disrespecting them, not honoring them, and also not fulfilling the rights that is owed to them. Right? All of that is included in that. So, so this is why it's very important. And so this is highlighted in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also that this is a fard ayn. Fard ayn. What is fard ayn? It is... So we read this. Fard ayn is individual obligations. Individual obligation. Fard kifaya is communal obligation. There are things, brothers and sisters, that if you do as a community, the sin is lifted off the rest, such as Salat al-Janazah, the funeral prayer. There are, like if somebody has a school that has knowledge, teaching of the Qur'an, there's some that build a hospital, there's some that, you know, um, take care of the societal needs. As long as there's some that do that part, the obligation is lifted from the rest. However, there are also obligations that we as Muslims need to do that relate to us individually. It doesn't mean that if a, if a group does it, you're off the hook. No. Every single Muslim, it is obligatory upon them to show excellence to their parents. So, Bir al-Walidain. And he says, I wanted to guide some of the intelligent people for I've been asked about the reality of Burur, which is Bir. And so he's saying that I'm responding to the request. I'm, I want to guide some of the intelligent people that have asked me about this reality. By responding, he is, number one, assisting them, assisting those who will read his book, assisting those who will then listen to his teachings like we are today. And in doing so, there's a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that Allah is in the assistance of his servant, so as long as the servant is in the assistance of his brother. So this aun from Allah, this help from Allah, it comes to the person as long as that person is helping others. This is why the scholars mention, if you need help from Allah, go help somebody else. If you have a need you need to remove, go remove the need of someone else. By doing that, it comes back for you, right? And same that when you make dua for someone in, in the unseen, meaning someone not present, we should say, someone who is not present and you make dua for them, there's an angel that says, and for you the same, for you the same. And the scholars mentioned that the quickest dua that reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one where you ask Allah to bless or whatever dua you make for the person who is not present with you, for your brother, for your sister. So however we interact with others is how Allah ta'ala will treat us, how he will deal with us. You're always helping others, Allah will help you. You're spending on others, Allah will spend on you. Then the Hadith Qudsi mentions, spend, O son of Adam, O son of Adam, spend, and I will spend on you. What do we understand from the opposite? If we hold on to our wealth and don't spend, then Allah will not spend on us. But if we spend, Allah will spend. If we feed others, Allah will feed us. If we are in the assistance of others, Allah will be at our assistance and help us. This is very, very important. And so this is what the Shaykh is essentially doing. Now, in responding to, an, to this call, somebody had asked him to write about showing excellence to parents. He's in reality also answering the situation and the circumstance of the time. They call this lisan al-hal, the state of the people as if it was speaking with a tongue saying, teach us about the bir al-walidain, teach us about being excellent to our parents. And this is the time that we're in also. Our time is screaming 
saying, please teach us about the rights that are owed to parents and may Allah Ta'ala help us all. Also, there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about being at the assistance of his community and the creation of Allah. It mentions all creatures, Al-Khalqu kulluhum Allah. The creation, all of them are the dependence of Allah. فَأَحَبُّهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنفَعُهُمْ لِعِيَالِهِ The most beloved of them to Allah are those that are most beneficial to his dependents. Imam al-Haddad and other scholars mention what is the best way you could be beneficial to others of the creation of Allah? Through da'wah, through calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through teaching them and guiding them and that which is an obligation upon them and that which is recommended upon them by teaching them their religion. You are being the most helpful and beneficial to others in how you benefit their creation. And he said, I have named this and the name that he titles amongst one of two is success of the two abodes through bir of the parents and Allah is all forgiving. And so this is what he, how he starts his book. And then the first part that he starts with is bir in speech after the introduction. Righteousness and bir as it relates to speech. So now we're going to speak about if we want to be pious and if we want to honor our parents, let's first start off with the way that we speak to them. Many youth in our time, they speak to their parents where they talk back, they argue, they raise your voice, they raise their voice, they show um, uh, opposition to their wants and desires by speaking about it, etc. All of that is not from our teachings, and it's not from the Qur'anic commandment. In the lines of poetry, he mentions what the, the reality of being good to our parents relates to four different parts of our body. Relates to one, to the tongue and how we speak to them, with our heart, with our whole body, and with our wealth as well. Each one of these has a specific role in showing excellence to the parents, and we're going to go through that, inshallah. The first is as for speech, it is that you speak to them softly, you speak to them politely, you speak to them in a way that Allah has commanded. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 17, verse 23 of the Quran, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And speak to them قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Respectfully is how it's translated in an honorable way. Ibn Abbas, Ibn, Ibn al-Musayyib, one of the top tabi'een of his time, and Ibn Abbas is the greatest of, amongst the companions, the, one of the greatest of the commentators of the Qur'an. They both said that this type of speech is the speech of a servant, that a slave in particular, who has sinned and done something really, really wrong, and now is speaking to a harsh boss, a harsh master, and they have to explain themselves. So now, one of the things that might come to your mind, many of us living now in our time, that sounds a little harsh. That sounds a little difficult. What is that? This is called adab. This is called etiquette. This is how the commentators have explained how we are to speak to the parents. Now, that might be very, very, very far from our reality. But we have to at times learn what is the most excellent of ways that's been transmitted by our predecessors so we can have an idea how far we've strayed from where we need to be, right? If we are out in the ocean and we wanted to just kind of go in one of those round tubes and just kind of swim off on our own, if we don't have a rope, we're never going to know how far we are from the boat. We need to have these examples. We need to know how far we have come. In hearing this, when it shocks us, it also indicates to us how far we've come in that we yell at our parents, we get upset at them, we say harsh words to them, we hurt their feelings, Allah forgive us. We do a lot of things like that, and this shows that we are very, very far from where we need to be. Other commentators, they say that it also includes in it 
the most noble of titles for your father, right? Ya abati, oh my dear father, right? Oh my dear mother. These are high words of how we are to deal or how we're to call them. Sure, you can say daddy, dad, that's fine, but there's better even when you can find, say, Umar interpreted that it is to choose the best of available titles and words amongst language to address them. Subhanallah, it's amazing. And if you put it this way in your life, think about the person that you most respect and honor in your life. Think about the person that you have the most respect for. How do you speak to them? It could be your teacher, it could be a professor, it could be the president, a governor, it could be a king, whatever it is. How, when you go to them, how do you speak to them? The way that you speak to them, they do not deserve that respect like your parents deserve. Your parents deserve the number one best respect that is due to them. So speak to them in that way, the best that you can find in addressing them. Even raising our voice in a louder tone to not do so. You know, where mother calls you and you say, yes, I'm coming. And you raise your voice and you yell back. That is not to be done. If you need to, get up and go walk to wherever they are and tell them in a calm, respectful manner. Because certainly, if a president called you, you wouldn't say, I'm coming. Right? And we wouldn't do that. So your parents have higher degree than even the presidents and the governors. So in speaking to our parents, we are to use the most respectful, most honored of all speech, and we are to uh, honor them in that way. And then inshallah, the text is going to go into many other aspects, but these are shorter classes as inshallah, this is for youth and this is the beginning and in our introduction to this class. If there's any questions on what we've covered, uh, we'd very happily inshallah address that. Other than that, you can also, inshallah, get this book as well. Um, yeah, mashallah, Sidi Harun, barakallah fikum. Um, yes, you can ask questions. Amen. Somebody asked, inshallah, barakallah fikum. May Allah bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you an eye of those who show excellence to our parents, to our grandparents, to our teachers, and the general public of all Muslims. May Allah Ta'ala honor us with good character. But you can certainly go ahead and ask. Many of the things that you might ask are going to be covered in the classes to come. This is the introduction to the text, to the content that we're going to be speaking about. And then inshallah, we ask you all to register for these classes that are um, they're free. There's no charge. But once you, well, the point about registering is that you can ask questions on the forum. There will also be special live sessions just to directly take your questions and address them and many other benefits, including resources and stuff like that. So how should someone deal with a parent who suffers mental illness and doesn't want to recognize it or treat it and the behavior is affecting the adult children's close relationships and emotional probably, and their emotions. So, you know, in that case, one of the things that you can do, obviously, is there's nothing wrong as Muslims that we take the means of consulting those who have knowledge in those fields. If they have a mental illness, this requires that you try to get, you know, consult those who have knowledge in your community, go to the local sheikh and imam, to just ask if there's things they can help in guiding and facilitating and giving them advice. And then also health professionals also that can help them in their mental illness. What you cannot do, it doesn't matter even if they have certain illnesses or difficulties. Um, the respect that we owe them can never be altered no matter what. You know, even if they yell at you, they treat you bad. The Prophet Sallallahu once somebody asked them, what if they oppress us? What if they do dhulm? And he responded, wa in dhalama, wa in dhalama, wa in dhalama. Even if they oppress you, even if they oppress you, even though they even if they oppress you, you're always to honor and respect and not go past that relationship. 
as for getting help and as for getting guidance and stuff like that, you should definitely try to seek that to improve that. And at a certain point, it might just require that you're just patient with what has been afflicted upon you, make dua to Allah. And sometimes in life, in all honesty, certain situations in life, there's no easy way out around it except to be patient. Because with patience, the rewards you get with patience, you don't get with anything else in our religion. The ajr of the sabir, the one who is patient, their ajr is that they will enter Jannah on the Day of Judgment without any account. They'll be one of the first people to enter Jannah. Bighayri, he said. Why? Because patience is such a hard and difficult thing to do. And patience is holding yourself to be in line with Allah's divine commandment when yourself wants to either break out of it or do something else opposed to what is happening. You respond to that situation that circumstance in a manner that allah wants you to react with it or to demonstrate and show the adab and requirement and response to it the correct response to that tribulation is from patience this is why patience is not just always translated as you know sabr we should say it's not always just patience but sabr also pertains to when you're doing good deeds as well that you're patient in it because Holding yourself calm and reacting to it in the correct way takes effort. So, you know, if you can, do not abandon them. Be with them. Try to take care of them your own self. For Allah may give you openings in your own religion you would have never, ever experienced had it not been for taking care of your parents and their difficulty as they took care of us when we were little. Somebody asked, well, you know, they took care of us. We we're a little kid. Now they're older. I didn't get a choice. No, but this is debt you're born into. Someone who has done ihsan for you, you owe them. You're not God. You're the creation of God. Allah Ta'ala has brought us into this world in a certain manner that we owe others, including our parents, our teachers, those who raised us, those who taught us, and those who helped us. This is what our deen teaches, that you have a debt to them and there's a way you respond. And so in that response, inshallah, hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a way out. You're with them a short time. Try to be patient. Get the help that you need. You know, seek um, professional advice on that. What would be the best route? Inshallah, may Allah make that easy for you. Any other questions, inshallah? Like this class, inshallah, is once a week on Wednesday nights, depending where you're watching from. And inshallah, we will continue. And there are going to be 12 lessons. And this is a level three for youth class. Do mind that, inshallah. It's all the adults are definitely welcome to attend. But we're going to try to cater and, and um, inshallah, provide. Uh, I want to keep it as, I, as much as I can related to the youth and youth behavior. We're all youth at one time. We're all young at one time. And we had noble teachers um, uh, that taught many of us. And Sidi Harun Sellers, who's watching, knows some of those blessed teachers that we all sat with during that time and benefited from, who brought the West African text into our lives and who brought noble teachers that really changed our lives. And here we are. It's our, it's our turn in a very, very low way to try to change the, the 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 lives of others and then they in turn inshallah change the life of others lives of others may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us all jazakum la khair we'll see you next week wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin